I hurriedly ordered the blowing stopped, lest we broach and become an easy target. The trim had to be adjusted several times due to lack of Lieutenant Tokugawa's services before the boat could be steadied at 200 feet. I finally caught my breath then, and thanked heaven, had the American shown just a bit more persistence and determination, he would have had a kill. Instead, RO101 enjoyed three more months of life, a check of damage revealed that our periscope was smashed. That cut our operations short, I put about, and headed back for Rabaul. Lieutenant Tokugawa died before morning, leaving us the problem of disposing of his body. One seaman suggested that we place it in a torpedo tube, which is what we did, sealing the tube against odours. On arrival at Rabaul, we counted a total of 127 dents in RO Wan Tawan's hull, where shells from USS Taylor had struck. She must have been using high-capacity type rather than armour-piercing ammunition, else I would not be alive today. The gunnery of that American ship was excellent. RO101 was out of action, awaiting installation of a new periscope that had to come from truck for the rest of July. During my period of enforced idleness, Japan lost three more submarines. Back home in the inland sea, Lieutenant Commander Hiroshi Yuasa was conducting shakedown training in I-179. His ship suffered an accident and sank on July 14th. I-179 remained on the bottom until 1956, when it was salvaged. Examination of it at that time revealed an open hatch near the bow. A careless crewman had neglected to close it, and the bow filled with water, sinking the ship. I-168 was next. Yahachi's old boat, killer of USS Yorktown at Midway, left Truk for a patrol on July 25th. She was sunk in a submarine versus submarine battle on July 27th by USS Scamp. Apparently both submarines fired torpedoes at each other, but I-168s missed. Americans erroneously listed this sinking as that of I-24, which actually had already been lost far to the north in the Aleutians eight weeks earlier. The third submarine lost was RO-103, under Lieutenant Rikinosuke Ichihara. It left Rabaul on patrol duty July 11th. She was last heard from on July 28th, when Ichihara reported sighting enemy ships on three occasions between July 15th and July 24th, but had no chance to attack. I do not think that this boat was lost operationally, but rather by either enemy aircraft or PT boats, which sometimes attacked a submarine contact but didn't get credit for a kill, because they couldn't provide physical evidence that the submarine was sunk. Enemy patrols were so heavy in the Solomons at that time that it seems to me very likely that one of them made a hit on RO-103, or perhaps the submarine struck a mine, after which Ichihara's boat crawled away to die. Lieutenant Kazumichi Tanabe was flown out of Japan to take the place of my slain Lieutenant Tokugawa. We also received three fresh and bright young seamen from the Rabul base to replace those injured by USS Taylor's gunfire. Our new periscope was installed, and we were combat ready by August 3rd. I then conducted three days of drills and refresher training, and found morale very high. The men of RO101 had been through the shattering experience of being both shelled and depth-charged, and survived. They were full of fighting spirit and eager for revenge, we put to sea again on August 7th, this time headed for waters south of Vela Lavella Island. The Battle of Vela Gulf was fought the night of Aug 6, four Japanese destroyers carrying 900 army troops for reinforcement of Kolombangara were intercepted by six American destroyers. We lost three ships and 1,500 men. About 300 men made it to shore from the sunken ships. The Americans' campaign had gone well for them in spite of losses in the year between their landing on Guadalcanal and my setting out from Rabaul on August 7th, on my eighth Solomon's mission. Although the going had been slow and the fighting hard, the Americans progressed without a setback upwards along the stinking, disease-ridden chain of islands. They had covered half of the distance from Henderson Field to Simpson Harbour. And, on New Guinea, in the long campaign written off as the toughest fighting in the world, our troops had been driven back from within sight of Port Moresby, their chief objective on the island's south side, 
and had to retreat northward over the Owen Stanley Mountains under ghastly conditions. Now they were being pushed westward, along New Guinea's northern shore. RO-101 was on station by August 10th, but as a sentry we were, for the most part, ineffective. We were often attacked by planes at night, when I had to surface to recharge batteries. Apparently the enemy was spotting us on airborne radar, then shutting down his engines to dip in and make a silent glide-bombing attack. We rarely heard these aircraft until almost too late. And once the bombers came, PT boats usually showed up within the next thirty minutes. After a while, knowing that the enemy was always avidly seeking us during the late hours of darkness, I got an idea that served RO-101 well. Enemy patrols, I had observed, were lightest during the morning and evening twilight periods, and those times gave my lookout some light by which to see any bombers approach. Instead of the standard tactic, submerged daytime cruising followed by nighttime surface operations, I cruised submerged all day long and surfaced during evening twilight, while the sun's glow was still in the sky, but visibility was poor. Once my batteries got a full charge, down I would go again and remain underwater all night, surfacing just before the sun rose. Then we would recharge and go down again. My tactic was successful, but it limited RO101's ability to patrol any significant size area because of our low underwater speed. And the pesky PT boats seemed always to be about. We had to stay down to avoid detection. PT boats made my submarine totally worthless on that patrol. By August 15th, 1943, I had moved north to Gizo Strait, south of Vela Gulf. We knew that US interceptor forces were watching in that area for Japanese attempts at reinforcing our garrisons in various parts of the Solomons, and I hoped to pick off a few enemy ships. About 1am on the morning of August 18th, I saw some gun flashes through my periscope. To the north, surface ships were exchanging gunfire. I thought that our ships must be clashing with American ones and ordered my crew to battle stations, submerged. Load all tubes, I called out, and made ready to join in the battle as soon as I could determine friend from enemy. One hour later, while I was still making an underwater approach to the scene of the battle, my sound operator picked up an echo on his equipment. Possible destroyer, he called out, running at high speed. Stand by all tubes. I ordered. Target is a destroyer. Set torpedo running depth at two metres. All lights in the conning tower had long since been dimmed, so I could avoid night blindness. I swung the periscope about until it was on the bearing the sound operator had given me. There was a faint moon, and the horizon was clear, but I could make out no ship. Target approaching was the next word I received. Degree of intensity is four. Five was the lowest reading our sound equipment registered, and one was its highest. The first report had been five. After this second report, I began to make out a dark image on the horizon. Then I discerned another. Two ships were heading in our direction, both coming directly at RO101. Their head-on approach made the silhouettes very slim, and I could not identify them by type. I tried to judge their speed from the bow wave each was making and called out, Target speed is 26 knots. There are two ships in sight. The targets then began veering off, a bit to my right, but still making good speed. I was sure our presence was not suspected, because no ship could use its sonar while moving that fast. Their own propellers drowned out everything. Now I could make out their flat, flush decks. They were American destroyers, the nearest one was not more than 500 yards away from me and crossing rapidly. I realised that I had no chance at all to hit him with a torpedo and swung my periscope over to the second ship. Then I began calling out ranges and bearings. Bearing Mark, I cried out, and Lieutenant Kondo answered. Set. I was ready to give the order to fire when the great wake of the first ship rolled toward me, obscuring my view. I cursed mightily but could not let the chance pass without an attempt to strike at the enemy. In seconds that second ship would escape. Fire, I ordered, even though I could not see my target, and four torpedoes leaped one after another from their tubes. 
The angle between the destroyer's bow and the line of sight between my boat and him was 40 degrees. Right. Range was 600 yards. My torpedoes would have to make a run of less than a half mile. A submarine could not possibly have a better setup for a torpedo attack. But my torpedoes were wasted. All four missed the enemy ship astern. He must have been making at least 30 knots instead of the 26 knots I had estimated. I was ashamed of making such an error in judgment. Nothing humiliated a submarine commander before his crew more than wasting torpedoes in such a manner. The only high moments in the lives of men who lived for weeks in Japan's iron whales were when they heard their torpedoes crashing into an enemy's hull. We heard one explosion a long time afterward, but not from the direction in which I had fired. I ordered the periscope up again and looked north through Gizo Strait. A ship was aflame there. Was it one of ours, or one of theirs? From post-war readings, I have determined that the burning ship was the Japanese destroyer Izokaze. She had been hit by American ships in Vela Gulf. The ships that my torpedoes missed were two victorious American destroyers, which were withdrawing after the battle. They were seeking out the small craft that had been escorted by four of our destroyers under Rear Admiral Matsuharu Ijuin. As a lieutenant commander, he was my swimming instructor and also was my instructor in torpedoes during my years at Etajima. He pushed us very hard in both things, since he was also the supervisor for the annual ten-mile swimming race. Had I hit one of those destroyers, I might have saved some of the men Ijuin had been prevented from saving because those American ships, after driving off Ijuin's force, ran rampant among our landing barges loaded with reinforcements. Many men died. I was called back to Rabaul on August 24th, and arrived there on August 26th. A cabled set of orders was waiting for me. I was to depart R0101 and take command of I-177. I felt sad at leaving the crew that I had trained from before R0101's completion, but that is the way it is in a war. As a man gets more experience, he moves into positions calling for greater skills, greater responsibilities and greater challenges. While I had been out on this patrol, Japan lost four more submarines. The war in the Pacific was truly developing into a hellish one for our Sixth Fleet. Submarines in the Indian Ocean had things a lot easier than we did in the Pacific. I-10 and I-27 both reported sinkings in August. We at Rabaul envied them, because they were doing what we felt all our submarines should be doing, attacking enemy supply lines. We were accomplishing very little in our theatre of war, and were paying too heavy a price to spot and stop the Americans as they advanced. I-17, which had shelled the American west coast in February 1942, left Truk on July 25th to make air reconnaissance of Espiritu Sancto in the New Hebrides and of Numea. New Caledonia. She had a new captain, Commander Hakwe Harada, as commanding officer of I-165 in Malay water at the war's start. Harada had been the first to sight HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse, thus launching the great search that saw our aircraft send these two battleships to the bottom. On the morning of August 19, 1943, Harada was about 40 miles off Noumea, preparing to launch I-77's plane when an American land-based aircraft sighted his submarine in this helpless state. It attacked at once, and a number of men were caught on deck. The New Zealand corvette HMAS Zui came up and joined in the attack. I-17 was sunk, next to be lost was I-182, commanded by my Etajima classmate, Lieutenant Commander Mirioru Yonehara. The young tribe master left Truk for the New Hebrides area and was not heard from after August 28th. His was truly a tragedy in the great Japanese tradition. American sources state that I-182 was sunk by USS Trout in the Philippines on September 10th. This claim is ridiculous. Yonehara's boat was nowhere near that area. He and his crew were off the New Hebrides, which are not very far as Pacific Ocean distances go from the Fijis. I-182 was lost in the same part of the Pacific where the native princess lost her heart to its captain years before. I think that the American destroyer Wadsworth, although it did not receive official credit for a sinking sent I-182 down about the 1st of September. 
I have also read that Americans claim to have sunk I-178 on August 25, 1943. They did not. That submarine had already been lost three months before. The boat that they sank that day, off the New Hebrides, was RO-35, Lieutenant Commander Masateru Manabe. She went to that area from Truk and, on August 25th, radioed that she had a convoy of six transports in sight. She was not heard from again. The American destroyer Patterson picked up RO-35 that night on its radar. Patterson moved in and RO-35 dived, but sonar, tenacity and depth charges enabled Patterson to sink RO-35 before midnight. The last time anyone heard from I-25 and Lieutenant Commander Masaru Kobiga was on August 24th, when he reported that his aircraft's reconnaissance of Espiritu Sancto was successful. Kobiga, who had left Truk late in July, sent a report on the ships that were present in the enemy anchorage and was never heard from again. I think that his boat, like I-182, was attacked and sunk by an enemy ship, or perhaps even an enemy plane, which never received credit for a kill because it could not provide evidence of a sinking. Warrant Officer Nobuo Fujita, who had made so many flights from I-25, including his firebombings of America, was not lost. After his attacks on Oregon, he made only one more flight over enemy territory, at Noumea. Then he was transferred from submarine duty to a flight instructor post at Kasumikara, not far from Tokyo, where he spent the rest of the war training pilots for our naval air force. These four submarines were the price we paid for sinking only two enemy ships, which went down in the New Hebrides. I-17 reported downing one before she was lost. I-19 claimed another upon her safe return to truck. I-19 had hit the American lumber carrier, SS Absaroka, with torpedoes on Christmas Eve, 1941, off San Pedro. Eighteen years later, Mr. Robert Bell claimed to have found the hull of a submarine on the ocean floor nearby, and Fort MacArthur records showed that a Japanese submarine identified as I-19 had been sunk there in 1941. This is, of course, not true. All of the nine submarines went to the U.S. West Coast early in the war, returned safely. I-11 had some luck in southern waters. She sank three ships in one day off Australia. These were SS Coast Farmer, SS GS Livanos and SS William Dawes. She got them on July 21st on August 30th while returning from patrol. She sank SS Star of Oregon. I spent a few days turning over command of RO-101 to my successor, Lieutenant Masataka Fujisawa. We went out and made a few dives too so that he could become familiar with the little oddities each individual ship has, which give it the personal character that crewmen come to know and have affection for. On September 4th, 1943, I left RO-101, somewhat heavy of heart. This feeling had to disappear almost at once, for in a few minutes I was on board and in command of I-177, moored only 300 yards away. I relieved Commander Hajime Nakagawa. For the previous four weeks, he had been making supply runs from Rabaul to New Guinea. The attempt to reinforce and keep the Guadalcanal and New Guinea garrisons supplied was made in four different ways. First, of course, were the large-scale attempts made with transports that were escorted by cruisers, destroyers, and sometimes battleships and aircraft carriers. We lost too many of the large-type ships in the first fierce fighting around Guadalcanal to continue this method. The Imperial Army then brought its own sea forces into play. The Army would assemble a convoy of 10 to 20 small cargo carriers and landing craft, each carrying 10 to 20 tonnes of food and ammunition, at Shortland Island, off the southeast tip of Bougainville. From this staging point, about halfway down the slot from Rabaul to Henderson Field, they would steam for the combat area. Their pilots knew nothing of the area's geography, and the smallest craft mounted but a single machine gun each. Moving only by night, they hid in coves and inlets during the day. Their average pace was a sluggish six knots. It took these vessels more than a week to cover the 300 miles to Guadalcanal, and American PT boat squadrons often attacked them en route. Dozens were sunk, but surviving craft pressed toward their destination with vigour and determination. 
Because they swarmed down in groups like ants, this means of supplying Guadalcanal was called the Ari ant system. But no matter how hard these ants worked, what they got through to the hard-pressed garrison on the Death Island was like a cup of water poured on the desert not enough to sustain life. So Admiral Yamamoto made the difficult decision to employ destroyers for supply runs. A group of destroyers would form up at Shortland, usually loaded with troops and hundreds of drums of supplies lashed to the decks. Many of these drums contained gasoline and one enemy hit could make a funeral pyre of a ship. The destroyers would race out in the morning and make their way at 30 knots to the western end of Guadalcanal, covering the final miles during darkness. Because the destroyers could carry large payloads of troops and supplies, the method was moderately successful. They did not fear the PT boat attacks because they could fight back hard when attacked. The Americans found this to be true at Tassaferonga on November 30th, 1942, the night when Rear Admiral Raizo Tanaka mauled three American cruisers and sank a fourth. Although his ships were outnumbered, outgunned, and had their decks crowded with drums of supplies. The Americans nicknamed this the Tokyo Express. We Japanese called it the Nazumi rat system. With their radar, the American destroyers were like cats in the dark, ready to pounce, and the rats had to elude them. Our best weapons were speed and elusiveness, which is what rodents use to escape death. American aircraft, however, with their radar, could detect the rats at a great distance, then swoop in like eagles to attack them. On dark nights they had additional help in their bombing runs, being guided to their targets by the phosphorescent wake every ship makes in the Solomon's waters. So, whenever lookouts heard the roar of aircraft engines, a ship's captain would slow his vessel radically to leave very little wake, then change course sharply so the glowing path left behind would not serve as an arrow pointer for the bombardiers. If aircraft, in spite of this, still found our ships, at a given signal all searchlights which had been aimed at the attacking plane were turned on simultaneously. This sudden glare would blind the enemy pilot, anti-aircraft and machine guns, then were often able to shoot him down or drive him off. The Americans countered by using the glide bombing tactic, which I had to endure many times myself. Upon locating one of us, the enemy planes would shut off their engines and drop silently down. Having no radar, our destroyers found it especially difficult to cope with this attack, so they were rarely used for transport operations after November 30th, 1942. That is when the Magura Mole system was put into operation. At about the same time, for the same reasons, shortage of surface ships plus intensified enemy air operations. The Magura method was used in supplying New Guinea too. Most of our operating submarines were used for this work, leaving very few for offensive operations against our enemies. Usually one or two, at the most three, submarines were sent to waters east of Australia at a time. They could do very little to stop the massive flow of supplies that was coming out of the United States to equip forces gathering on the southern continent. It was easier for the Americans to supply Australia all the way from the United States than it was for us to supply our southern holdings from Japan, which was a much shorter distance away. And enemy submarines inflicted upon Japan many more times damage than our submarines inflicted upon the enemy. Nevertheless, I-10 sank SS Samuel Gompers off the east coast of Australia on January 29, 1943. And I-21 got SS Starking on February 9 in that same area, but throughout the first half of 1943, our sinkings of enemy ships were very few. On April 27th, SS Lydia Child went down off Brisbane before the torpedoes of I-178. I-19 sank two ships on a cruise into the southern seas, SS Phoebe Ahurst near the Fijis on April 20th, and SS William Vanderbilt east of New Caledonia on May 16th. I-174 got two ships on the same day, south of Guadalcanal, sinking SS Chief Ure and SS Robert Lincoln on June 22nd. The day before I assumed command of I-177, we lost still another submarine in the New Hebrides area, I-20, under Lieutenant Commander Hitoshi Otsuka. 
On August 30th, a report came in from Otsuka that he had sighted a force containing one battleship and one aircraft carrier. No more was ever heard from him. On September 3rd, the American destroyer Islet notified that a submarine had been spotted in her area, picked up I-20 on radar. She closed in and blinked. A-A, A-A, the call signal for challenge. When she received no answer, she illuminated the seascape with her searchlights and saw a submarine diving. Depth charges soon killed I-20, which was our 37th submarine lost in the war. Upon taking command of I-177, I joined the New Guinea supply effort. At the outset I was in fine health. I had a stocky body frame, which I kept fit through exercise and healthy through good food. After my tour of duty in R0101, during which I ate well, slept well and was usually fairly relaxed, I was hale and hearty. Whenever in port at Rabaul I had played tennis to keep fit and gone fishing to relax. Also, whenever possible, I had a one-hour nap in the afternoon, drank a little beer now and then, and took advantage of being on shore to take soothing hot showers often. That peak condition, I believe, sustained me during my tour of duty as commanding officer of I-177. I was able to carry on longer than most. I made a total of 14 transport runs to New Guinea from Rabaul in I-177, the second highest number made by any I-boat captain. I set out on the first one on September 10th. RO-1001 also left Simpson Harbour that day. She was ordered into the South East Solomons, but not one word was heard from her after her departure. After the war, I learned that my former boat had been sunk almost as soon as she got on station. Lieutenant Commander Fujisawa met up with a small convoy on September 15th and launched an attack. His torpedoes missed and one of the convoy escorts USS Sawfly tracked him down. The destroyer attacked with depth charges, finally hitting close enough to make RO-101, blasted upward by explosions, broach. Sawfly, joined by a Catalina patrol bomber, opened up with gunfire while the aircraft dropped depth charges. RO-101 was sunk quickly, before departing Rabol. I was briefed on the New Guinea situation by Commander Miyoshi Horinuchi, Chief of Staff to Rear Admiral Harada. On the fourth of the month, he said, the enemy landed troops at a point north of our garrison at Lae. Our garrison of about 7,000 men is now surrounded. Horinuchi told me that Lieutenant General Hatazo Adachi, commander of the 18th Army Corps, was in charge of all Japanese troops on New Guinea. His chief subordinate was Lieutenant General Hidemitsu Nakano, who had the 51st Division. His chief Navy subordinate was Rear Admiral Kunizo Mori, commander of the 7th Base Corps, an organisation like the Seabees of America. Men of our Base Corps would set up a base and operate it, also helping to defend it if it were attacked. Japanese sailors also were formed into amphibious attack units too, like the American Marines, getting training in machine guns, artillery and tank warfare for this purpose. Such men defended Tarawa and other island bases because of their current poor tactical situation, said Horinuchi. The Lai garrison is going to execute a withdrawal. Beginning on the 11th, they will start moving out. All troops should be away from there by the 16th. They will cross the mountains and regroup at Gali, on New Guinea's north shore. The mountain range is over 14,000 feet high where they will cross it, and they will require three weeks to make the trip. To sustain them during this manoeuvre, they will need the food we are going to put on board I-177. It's up to you, Orita, to get through, my Itajima classmate, Mochitsura Hashimoto, had been through submarine commander's school with me in 1942. After graduation, he was assigned to the old boat RO-31 for eight months. He was the man who carried out the experiments that developed the containers used by our submarines in supplying Guadalcanal and New Guinea. Hashimoto was aghast at seeing the first contrivance he was asked to test. It was a sort of fragile torpedo. A rubber bag was filled with rice, he said and was then put into a long wooden cylinder that had a hard veneer all over it. The idea was to fire these containers like torpedoes at Guadalcanal, so that men could retrieve them from the beach while the submarine lay offshore, still submerged. But when we used a normal charge of high-pressure air to fire them, 
They burst, with rice going everywhere. The idea just wouldn't work, which surprised no one because it was so ridiculous. Another idea did work. Balloons and rubber bags were partially filled with various supplies, then inflated with air while lying on RO-31's main deck. Then they were lashed into place. A submarine could release these and dive out from under them, leaving them to float on the surface, so small craft from shore could recover them. This useful idea, coupled with one of using partially filled steel drums, was used by us in the south. Our plan was to avoid full moon periods whenever possible and arrive at our destination after dark. There, barges and lighters from shore would take off the supplies we carried, although in an emergency we could simply roll the steel drums over the side. They, like the rubber bags, would float. It took two days to load I-177 properly. We loaded 40 to 50 tonnes of supplies inside of the submarine and 20 to 30 tonnes on deck in rubber bags and drums. Sometimes we worked under fire. The Americans were making daily raids on Rabul after October 20th, 1943. A humorous thing about these air attacks, Mr Harrington told me, is that during the war, writers always described us Japanese as being very predictable. Oddly, we found the Americans very predictable in attacking Rabaul. The raids usually were made between 10am and 2pm, so we would start our loading early in the morning, knock off work in time for the air raid, then submerge to the bottom of the harbour to have our lunch. We would come up after 2pm when the air raid was over and continue to load. At 120 feet, the only effect I-177 felt was a gentle rocking when a bomb exploded in the water. During the time I was operating out of Rabol, I can remember only one submarine being damaged in an air raid. It happened in the late morning of October 12th, 1943. I had just completed a transport run to New Guinea and was making my report to Rear Admiral Harada on board his flagship, Yuan Jinge, an ancient cruiser. About 50 Japanese warships, including submarines, were at anchor when a large group of B-17 and B-24 aircraft came over. They seemed to be directing their chief effort at our submarines, because no bombs fell near Jinge or the destroyers that were present. I watched the bombing with Admiral Harada and some of his staff, and became very worried about my boat. All submarines out in the harbour quickly dived, but bombs were falling so close to them that we could not really tell whether they were diving or sinking. Seven boats were present, I-36, I-38, I-176, I-177, I-180, RO-105, and RO-108. All but I-180 were moored in deep water. She was alongside a pier, undergoing repairs. From where we were, it looked like I-180 took a direct hit. We soon received no damage reports from the other boats. I was relieved to hear this, but the word from I-180 after the attack was over was sad. Bomb hit. Just forward of the bridge, it read. Superstructure destroyed. Executive officer, Lieutenant Toshio Higuchi, killed. Three seamen of Bridgewatch seriously wounded soon after the raid. The other six boats surfaced. I hastened to my ship. There I congratulated my executive officer, Lieutenant Yoshinosuke Kudo, and my crew for their alertness in diving the boat. A supply run to New Guinea usually required seven days for the round trip. We left Simpson Harbour and swung around to run along the north side of New Britain, travelling submerged after the first day's run. Boats were scheduled to arrive at destination during the third night out. After unloading, a submarine would race away at top speed in the darkness, cross the sea underwater in daylight, and return to Rabaul the same way she had left. I cleared the harbour and was running along the north side of New Britain, worried that the rough seas might carry away some of my on-deck cargo the men on New Guinea so sorely needed, when I received a wireless report from Rabaul. It said the enemy was making landings at Finchhafen, north of Cape Creighton, somewhat to the east of Ley. I-177 will intercept, read the new orders. When I announced this change of plans to my crew, all hands at once shouted, Eco, let's go. They were sick and tired of the dull transport duty they had been carrying out before I took over command. Here was a chance to fight, we had all four forward, and both after tubes loaded with torpedoes, and the men were eager for battle. We went cautiously through Dampier Strait underwater, 
and arrived off Finschafen on the evening of September 13th. Not one destroyer or any other enemy vessel was to be seen. I made a wide scouting sweep of the area, then headed for Ley. We arrived at the rendezvous point about 90 minutes after sunset on September 14th. The last of our forces were clearing out, and Ley was about to fall to the enemy. I could see fire at several places along the shore, someone shouted across the water to me. It is too dangerous to discharge your cargo right now. Enemy artillery can reach you, I put I-177 about and sailed away for a while. Enemy shells fell in our wake not long afterward, prompting me to dive the boat. About twenty minutes later we surfaced, returned to the rendezvous and began unloading. My crew quickly turned to, moving out the interior cargo via three hatches. We were almost finished with the job when my sound watch reported propeller noises some three miles distant. I quickly cleared the main deck and dived I-177 again, going all the way to our maximum safe depth of 330 feet. The sound watch reported four destroyers coming at us. I ordered the boat rigged for depth charge attack. But nothing happened, no depth charges were dropped upon us, and that somewhat disrupted my plans. I felt we had been trapped and intended to come to periscope depth, there to fight it out, rather than simply taking blow after blow until my ship was destroyed. As time went by, I realised that although he might have picked us up on his radar earlier, the enemy did not now have us on his sonar. Temperature of the water was 80 degrees on the surface, which probably saved my boat, crew and me. In the tropics, water can develop into strata at various levels. This caused sound in pulses to bend, giving false indications or none at all on the sonar equipment used in World War II. After a while, I took I-177 up to periscope depth. The destroyers had departed, so I moved to the surface and built up speed for the run out of that area. Mine was the last supply trip that Japanese submarines made into Ley, and I was back at Rabul on September 17th, completing safely my first round trip to New Guinea. Added to runs made by submarines between March and September 1943, the total cargo carried was more than 4,000 tonnes of food, ammunition, medicine and other supplies. On the same day I took command of I-177, a special order went out from Vice Admiral Komatsu to Commander Tsuso Inaba, who had I-36. Equipped with the scout aircraft nicknamed Geta because its pontoons resembled Japanese wooden clogs, I-36 was then at Yokosuka, undergoing refit. Admiral Koga had deduced from intelligence reports that the Americans were gathering in great strength at Pearl Harbor, so he made a special request of the 6th Fleet Commander. Admiral Komatsu's message to Inaba said you will make an air reconnaissance of Pearl Harbor base and report on enemy strength there. On the following day, I-8 arrived at Brest, France, the second Japanese submarine sent to Europe. She had left Penang, Sumatra in July and was destined to be the only one of five Japanese submarines sent to Europe that made the round trip safely. The other four were lost en route, Captain of I-8 was Commander Shinji Uchino, like myself a Kagoshima man. He had graduated from Itajima ten years before I did, and, so far as I am concerned, he was the master submariner of Japan. He was skipper of RO-27, the first submarine I went aboard. He gave me my first acquaintance with submarines at that time. In 1940, when I was an officer student at submarine school and again when I took the commanding officer's course in 1942, Uchino instructed me in submarine attack methods. In 1944, when I took command of I-47 and was assigned to Subron 11 while undergoing shakedown training, Uchino was its chief staff officer. Again, he taught me combat tactics. In 1945, when I took over the attack section of the submarine school at Kure, he was senior instructor there. Throughout my submarine career, I always seemed somehow to be under Uchino's wing. By nature, I was a plodding man and absorbed things somewhat slowly. I was often criticised by others as too slow to be a good submarine man, but Uchino always stood by me. He was not talkative, more like a scholar than a military man, but he was sympathetic and patient with others as well as me. 
Because of this kind of man who developed the method of torpedo fire control adopted by the Imperial Navy, I became a passable submarine captain. To this great man I owe the fact that I was one of the few Japanese submarine captains to survive the war. RO500, the first of two German submarine gifts to be taken into the Japanese Navy, was officially received on September 16th. Uchino, in I-8, had taken to France the crew for manning the second, RO501. I had hardly gotten I-177 back from its run to lay when I was ordered out again, this time to Finschaffen, an emergency landing point for submarine-borne supplies. I-774 and I-776 had just made trips there successfully. Now it was our turn. The entrance to the bay was about 200 yards wide and its area about two square miles. If there was no interference from enemy surface patrols, a submarine could move in easily, unload and turn around for the runout. It was almost ideal for our purposes. I headed there on September 21st, 1943. On the way out of Simpson Harbour, we met I-776, now commanded by Lieutenant Commander Kisaburo Yamaguchi. He hailed us and sent me a signal. PT boats are constantly patrolling near Finshafen Bay, it read. It would be best if you tried to make your run right into the bay while still submerged rather than entering on the surface. Don't forget that a red light on the point means danger and a green light means that all is well. Good luck. On the second night out from Rabul, I received a wireless that enemy troops had landed just north of Finchafen the night before. But no change was made in my original orders. At sunset of September 23rd, I arrived at a point about one mile from the mouth of Finchafen Bay. I took a good look around through the periscope, but saw no PT boats. Nothing was picked up by the sound watch either. I held a flashlight to the periscope and pointed the periscope toward the shore so that men there could see it. A green light flashed in response. All ahead full, I ordered, and kept I-177 submerged until we were well inside the bay. Then I slowed down and surfaced, moving into within hundred yards, then fifty yards, of the shore. Almost at once boats were alongside us and unloading began in the darkness. It was finished in thirty minutes. Soft calls of arigato, arigato, thank you floated across the water's surface. When the green light flashed from the mouth of the bay, I swung I-177 about and worked up speed to twenty knots as we dashed out of there. We encountered no trouble on the way back to Rabaul, and arrived there on September 26th. The month of September 1943 was a fair one in the Indian Ocean for Japanese submarines, but a poor one in the Pacific. We had eight boats to the west, working with German U-boats. They sank half a dozen ships, although the U-boats did better. In October, our Indian Ocean boats began withdrawing to Penang for refit, so no sinkings were made between Africa and Australia by the Sixth Fleet. Nor did our Pacific Ocean boats get any. Besides my two September trips to New Guinea, I made four in October, three in November and four in December, plus one in January. Six other submarines engaged in that effort during that period, I-6, I-16, I-36, I-38, I-174 and I-176. Commander Eitaro Ankyu of I-38 made the most trips 16, while I was second with my 14. It was Ankyu who towed an Uncato loaded with supplies and ammunition from Rabaul to Salamaua in June 1943. Commander Tsuso Inaba had tried to tow one all the way from Kure to Kiska with I-36, but trouble developed with his towing equipment and the mission was unsuccessful. All of my trips followed pretty much the same pattern, the six torpedo tubes were loaded, in case we met the enemy. But the extra torpedoes were removed from the hull to save weight. Our deck gun had already been removed, of course, leaving us but a single machine gun for defence on the bridge. All shells for the deck gun left the ship with it further decreasing our weight, and we made further reductions by removing all spare parts possible and cutting down on provisions for the crew. We carried only enough food for seven days. Even our ballast tank water loads were kept to a minimum to allow more cargo to be loaded under the close supervision of my new executive officer, Lieutenant Tadashi Obori, and Chief Petty Officer Yukio Oka, my chief of the boat.
They gave all orders to the crew and carefully directed the loading, stowage, trim and balance. Submarines heading for New Guinea often encountered enemy air attacks along the way, so the loading had to be done in such a manner as would still permit us to dive swiftly when necessary. Rice and wheat usually made up the bulk of our loads. These were poured into rubber sacks, 44 pounds to the bag, and sealed. So just enough air was left in each sack to give it some buoyancy. The bags were stacked on deck covered with nets and lashed down securely. What couldn't be put on deck went below. As for the rest of our cargo, a typical load consisted of canned food, canned biscuit, salt, soybean sauce, miso, bean paste, and umeboshi, dried plums. Many Japanese then believed that one could survive indefinitely on a diet of rice and umeboshi. Also included was katsuoboshi, the sticks of dried bonito fish I mentioned earlier. And, of course, we tried to load plenty of cigarettes. Clothing supplies included boots, jikatabi, split-toed sandals with rubber soles, and kaya mosquito nets. Munitions included small field guns, rifles, machine guns, bazookas, hand grenades, and small arms ammunition. We also took along portable radio transmitters and receivers. Quinine for fever made up the largest part of our medical supplies. Miscellaneous equipment included bicycles and small carts that could be towed behind the bicycles, flashlights, candles and matches. And I must not forget to mention what men on New Guinea often considered more important than anything else mail from home. By the middle of October, the American drive through the Solomons and Bismarck had really begun to gain momentum. They had driven us out of Colombangara and Vela La Vela and were gaining in strength on New Georgia. They were also massing for a move against Bougainville, an island that would put even their fighter aircraft within range of Rabaul. Nearly 350 enemy planes from New Guinea and Australia struck at Rabaul on October 12th. From then on, attacks were almost constant. On October 15th, construction of the final ship in the I-176 class was completed. She was I-185 on October 18th. The army's retreat from Ley, New Guinea, over the mountains to Gali on the north shore was completed. Of the 7,000 men who started out, over 1,000 perished along the way. The army could assemble only 4,600 men of the 21st and 51st Divisions at the rendezvous. The Navy, 1,300. Lieutenant General Adachi requested that submarines come to Sio and Gali after that, so from October 18 that was our destination. Sick and wounded were brought aboard from one side of a submarine while supplies were offloaded into Daihatsu on the other. I would put all hands who were not actually on watch to work unloading and they could usually finish the job in about 30 minutes. My men would form chains and they resembled a series of well-oiled pistons as I watched them from I-177's bridge. While 50 passed supplies over the side and took the helpless and sick on board, Another ten would undo the lashings that held down our deck cargo. When our hull was emptied of cargo and the sick men safely below, I would button up the boat and let I-177 slowly submerge. The bags of rice and wheat would then float free, and the Daihatsu working parties would still be picking them out of the water as I-177 cleared the area. I-36, under special orders from Admiral Koga, tried to send her plane in over Oahu on September 21st. The attempt was unsuccessful. Commander Inaba tried again on October 8th, with no luck. The hills of the Hawaiian chain were studded with radar sets by that time. Patrol ships also carried them, as did patrol aircraft. Inaba's reconnaissance pilot's problem was threefold. First, he had to avoid aircraft and get in past them close enough for his plane to make the round trip. Then he had to avoid ships which ranged far out from Pearl Harbor on surface patrol. After that, this pilot, in a very slow plane, had to avoid radar and high-speed interceptor planes which could shoot him down in one fast pass. Inaba's aircraft pilot and his crewmen finally solved the problem. The submarine cannot get in close enough so that an island will shield us from enemy radar during launching, Captain, they told him, and suggested that he launch them from far out at sea. They pointed out that a low-flying aircraft might be able to slip under the enemy's radar beams, 
provided that the shore defences had not been alerted to a submarine's presence. Inaba, then 300 miles south of Oahu, pointed out to the men that at that range they would not have enough fuel to get back to I-36. The pair simply shrugged. On October 19th, the plane was launched, and a shiver went down American spines when it got through. Its sighting caused a lot of excitement. The pilot reported seeing four aircraft carriers, four battleships, five cruisers, and 17 destroyers moored at Pearl Harbor. He was never heard from after that. I think he dived his plane into the sea rather than wait for pursuers to catch up with him. His information got to Admiral Koga and was followed by more from I-36 the next day. Commander Inaba reported a large convoy south of the Hawaiian Islands heading west. Almost immediately, I-19, I-35, I-169 and I-175 were ordered out to intercept. It was in October, after having carefully studied the German submarine we had given the designation RO-500, the High Command ordered construction of 23 special submarines. These were a revolutionary type of boat, designed expressly for very high underwater speed which was considered the best defence against enemy anti-submarine vessels, whose sonar could not work effectively if their propellers were turning over rapidly as during a pursuit. The subs were to be named the I-201 class and would have a speed that no other nation's submarines would ever match for years. With a length-to-beam ratio of 12 to 1, the I-201 subs would make 19 knots underwater for one hour. They were to be completely streamlined, with disappearing forward and after machine guns dropping down into the deck when not needed for use. The first of these submarines was completed in February 1945, just after I returned from a second mission using the most fantastic weapons of World War II. These were our Kaiten, our human torpedoes. The enemy wanted to establish an airbase on Bougainville. From there, his land-based fighters would be able to provide protective escort for the bombers attacking Rabul. This was part of a general plan to encircle our key base in that area, cut it off and render it useless. Then the enemy would sweep around and past Rabul toward other objectives. On November 1st, 1943, Bougainville was invaded at Cape Torokina, on its southern shore, with thousands of enemy troops moving into an area that was only lightly defended by our garrison. The enemy then dug in only 225 miles from Rabaul. He had to be driven away. This landing caught Admiral Koga, commander-in-chief of the Combined Fleet, somewhat off balance. He had just put almost all of his carrier-based planes ashore at Rabaul for a massive strike he intended to make against enemy ships in New Guinea waters. The bulk of his surface fleet was off Truk, so he sent down the ships from Rabaul to attack the enemy beachhead. This resulted in the Battle of Empress Augusta Bay, which pitched four Japanese cruisers and six destroyers against an American force of four cruisers and eight destroyers. It was a fight that might have been even had it not been for radar. In this battle, the American destroyers fired their torpedoes, then swerved out of the path of Japanese gunfire. The American cruisers, under Rear Admiral Merrill, stood off and poured out many salvos of six-inch shells, changing course every few minutes so as to avoid any torpedoes fired at them. One of our cruisers was sunk, as was a destroyer. Four others of our ships suffered damage. The counter-strike was turned back without getting anywhere near the enemy transports off Cape Torokina. The cruiser sunk was IJN Sendai, flagship of Rear Admiral Matsuji Ijuin's Destroyer Squadron 1. Ijuin survived the sinking but was not rescued at once. With the battle going against them, the rest of his ships had no choice but to retreat hastily, but Ijuin's great interest in physical fitness paid off for him. Ijuin Sendai went down early in the morning of November 2nd. In the forenoon of November 3rd, after swimming for nearly 30 hours, Ijuin was taken aboard Lieutenant Kenji Matsuda's RO-104, which had been sent out from Rabol to search for him. Had the situation not been so grim, there might have been humour in it. As an instructor at Etajima, Ijuin had been very hard on Matsuda during swimming classes. I-29 left Penang for Germany about this time. She was the third Japanese submarine to head for Atlantic waters. Her commander was our underwater ace, 
Commander Takaichi Kinashi, who had been scoring again in the Indian Ocean. Unfortunately, this mission was to be Kinashi's last. It would end in his death. November 3rd was the day Admiral Koga sent Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita down from Truk with eight cruisers and six destroyers. Kurita was to stop off at Rabaul for fuel, then race into Empress Augusta Bay, of which Cape Tokokina formed one arm. There, Kurita hoped he would find and smash the enemy's ships. When the enemy first landed on Bougainville, our air strength at Rabaul was nearly 400 planes. This force was to support Kurita by providing air cover. Kurita's force was smashed while still in Simpson Harbour. Two American aircraft carriers sent nearly 100 planes over Rabaul on November 5th to hit Kurita, having sighted his ships while they were on their way down from Truk. Mr Harrington learned from an American admiral who, as a commander, led some of the fighter planes in that attack. That American pilots had orders to cripple as many ships as possible, rather than concentrate on sinking just a few, so our ships could not get out to hit the beachhead at Bougainville. This the Americans truly accomplished. They put four of our cruisers and one destroyer out of action. Two undamaged cruisers had to escort the damaged ones back to Truk. The loss of half his forces and most of his firepower eliminated any chance for Kurita to make a surface strike. Two days later, using destroyers, our navy put 500 men ashore near Cape Torokina in a counter-landing, but this force was wiped out in a few days. Nothing could stop the Americans' march westward. By this time, Tokyo had reports from Tarawa Atoll in the Gilberts that the enemy was making air attacks on it. Rear Admiral Keiji Shibasaki, in command of Tarawa, had been building defences there to anchor our island network of defences. He had close to 5,000 men with him and concentrated his efforts on Betio, an island at the atoll's southern end. Shibasaki expected that any attack made on him by ships would be driven off by long-range bombers from New Britain and New Ireland, plus the heavy guns of Kurita's cruisers. But Kurita's strength was sapped in just one aerial attack, and the Bismarck's air strength was shattered by American air attacks in early November. Shibasaki had to fight it out alone, on November 11th, the fourth submarine attached to Europe, I-34, left Singapore under Commander Tatsuo Erie. He was to stop at Penang en route, then proceed to the Atlantic with a cargo of tin, tungsten, quinine and rubber for our German allies. All of it went to the bottom of the sea. Erie, the man so enamoured of his wife, died with all hands two days out of Singapore, ambushed by the British submarine HMS Taurus in Malacca Strait. Mr. Harrington interviewed one of two enlisted men who, with an officer, were the only Japanese to survive Betio, where the heavy fighting on Tarawa Atoll took place. Petty officer Tadao Unuki later became a taxicab dispatcher in early 1943. He was a truck driver with the Mihoro Air Group at Rabaul and was returned to Yokosuka when the group was disbanded for lack of replacements. Unuki answered a call for volunteers to perform hazardous duty in the south and soon found himself on Betio early in July. There he was, driver of a Type 97 light tank. Life on Betio was good, said Unuki. We had plenty to eat, drink and smoke, which was more than other outpost garrisons could say. Our sake ration was 1.5 quarts a month and there were enough non-drinkers and non-smokers that a man could always exchange enough sweets to put himself in a smoky cloud or alcoholic haze when he was off duty. Our recreation consisted chiefly of swimming and fishing. We all stayed very healthy because of Betio's malaria-free climate. Betio's tank was one of those assigned to protect Admiral Shibasaki's command post bunker, which looked out over the atoll's lagoon. Betio was heavily defended, because after the raid on Mackin Island in August 1942, high officials decided to fortify our Gilbert's holdings heavily. Besides a thick palisade of logs and sand running along the water's edge inside the lagoon, Betio had many pillboxes built of logs reinforced by steel casings and sand. Most of the defences were completed by the time I arrived at Betio, Unuki said, but we spent the next four months improving them. Physical fitness has always been a fetish with many Japanese, 
and Unuki told Mr. Harrington that many men improved their physiques by building bunkers stronger in their free time, adding extra layers of logs to them and heaping up more sand on their roofs. Admiral Shibasaki said, A million men could not take this island in a hundred years, when the defences were completed. American long-range bombers attacked Betio sporadically for months. Carrier planes hit it on November 18th and 19, since we had no surface fleet to send south. Only submarines were sent to repel attackers. Six out of nine boats ordered into the Gilberts were lost there before December 1st. The counter-attack on Tarawa should be studied by future submariners as a horrible example of how not to use undersea ships. American marines landed on Betio against heavy opposition on November 20th. They paid a high price for the island, but wiped out nearly all of its garrison and took control of the place in three days.